Good evening. Tonight I'll be be reading from the NIV, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Well, good evening. Oh, come on. I know y'all had a nap this I had my nap too, but we're all awake, right? Good evening, everybody. All right, good, 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 good. Good to see everybody tonight. Um, Our young folks are are at a devotional this evening, uh, so we want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, I know Trevor, uh, one of my sons, is doing the devotional, so I hope he does well. Uh, tonight. Proud that he's doing that. Uh, But we should have some more folks with us next week uh, because we're studying something that I think is very important. And to be quite honest with you, we we have not spent enough time on uh, in the last several years uh, in in, in the church. And and we need to ask this question, what is the church? And we're going to get deeper into the reason why we need to ask that question because it's important that we understand the answer to that question biblically. Um, you know, David, you led that song, God's Family, uh, brought back a lot of memories. When I was a kid growing up in Longview at the Pine Tree Church, uh, before they sold the building, which is now a Catholic church, uh, and moved literally like a quarter mile down the road, uh, evening service, you knew what the last song was going to be every Sunday night. It was going to be that song. We would stand and we would cross the aisles and we would join hands and we would sing God's Family. The, the first verse of God's family. And then that, that's how we closed out the service. And it was wonderful because that was the closing thought that you had going into the week. And family, church is important. I use that word family a lot. You may have noticed that. I use that word a lot because that's what, in a sense, the church is. The church is family. We're brothers and sisters. We're children of God. And so tonight, we're going to begin this study of the church of the Bible. Because you go out into the world, and you go up and down the road, you will see all kinds of buildings with church ascribed to it. This church, that church. But when you look at the Bible, and what Jesus said that, that was read, that Gerald read just a moment ago. He says, upon this rock, being the rock of Peter's confession of Jesus as Lord, I will build my church. It's, it's a singular noun. It's not a plural. And so this is what we're going to be looking at over a very long extended study. But beginning tonight, we're going to look at uh, this week and next week at, at things that the church isn't. Sometimes it's easier to understand what something is by defining what it's not. And so we're going to start tonight with that. Um, if you didn't see the, the, the sermon notes out in the foyer and up front this morning, it's, it's a full page. I need to get with, with, with Jackie and communicate a little bit more about what, what I had in mind. What I had in mind was a full page with holes punched in it that you would be able to have our normal sermon notes and some extra lines that you could jot some things down so that we could begin a, a, a notebook uh, for this study. And we'll, I'll get that, that was my mistake, I'll get that fixed this week so that we could do that. If anybody would be interested in that, you can just get a three-wing binder and keep those notes on this study. But tonight we're going to begin this study of the church of the Bible by talking about what the church is not. And the church is not a building. But before we do that, let's go to God in prayer together. Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us back together this evening. We thank you for the day of worship this morning. We thank you for 
the first day of the week and what that means to us as believers. It means being able to come together to worship, to remember what Jesus did for us at the cross, to encourage and uplift one another and to praise you in song and in prayer, to study your word, to share time with family, to step back from the worries and the troubles and the stresses of this world. We thank you for the opportunity to come back together this evening. It's been a long time since we've been able to do this because of things going on in the world. And Lord, we pray that this COVID situation will continue to, to diminish and dissipate and that we all can continue to go back to something that seems more normal. But you know, Lord, you've told us that this world is not our home. We're just passing through here. And we shouldn't get too comfortable here because you've called us to something greater and something better. Lord, help us to not only focus on our home in heaven, but to encourage others to come with us. Lord, tonight as we begin a study of the church of the Bible, help us to see exactly that. Help us to see the church of the Bible. Help us as we study this to understand that, that as human beings, we're fallible. As human beings, we, we make mistakes. As human beings, we can take that which you intended to be perfect and make it imperfect. Lord, help us to, to be able to lay those things aside that we prefer, that are our preferences, and come back to what you have called us to biblically as the church. Lord, be with us during this study. Spirit, speak powerfully tonight. Uh, in this message. May this message be your message, and may people who uh, watch this at a later time, who study this with us together, as we study together, help us to understand what you intended and what the church of the Bible truly is. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I can remember driving down the highway one time, and coming up behind an 18-wheeler and seeing this message on the back of the trailer. And the message showed a, a, a typical church building with a steeple and, and whatnot, and it had this message. It said, attend the church of your choice this week. Has anybody else ever seen that message before on the back of us? Okay, cool. Uh, several of you have, been, have seen the same thing that I've seen. Attend the church of your choice this week. And I thought to myself, when I saw that, is that right? Should I attend the church of my choice or the church of God's choice? You see, Jesus, if you look at the passage that Gerald read earlier, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 18, Jesus speaks of one church, just one. And it's important for us to understand what that one church is. Jesus had pulled his apostles, those that were his, he was closest to aside, and he said, hey, who do people say that I am? What are you hearing? What are you picking up on the street? And they said, hey, there's all kinds of speculation about who you are. This is what people are saying. And he, he was given all the different answers, but Jesus says, who do you say that I am. I'm not concerned right now about the world. I'm concerned about who you, those that are closest to me, believe that I am. Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up. You almost always depend on Peter to speak up. And Peter speaks up and he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter and, and Jesus says to Peter, You're right. This wasn't revealed to you by all the people around you. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, rock being the rock of his confession, not Peter. Peter's name in Greek is Petros. The word that Jesus uses is Petra, big rock. Confession, little pebble, Peter. Upon the rock, the big rock of your confession that I am the Son of the living God, I will build my church. Now, before you begin thinking, and people that are watching this, before you begin thinking, well, 
Devin's going to go into a study about why the Church of Christ is the only church. And you know the old sayings. I've grown up with it my whole life. Well, y'all think y'all the only ones going to heaven, don't you? It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the church of the Bible is the church of the Bible. I can remember being a student at Harding years ago. And Jimmy Allen, who passed away not, not long ago here at Christian Care, he presented a, a, an option to the elders of the College Church of Christ that kind of had them scratching their heads. There were, about, there, there were over 20 elders of that church. And he said, fellas, I tell you what, if you really want to be biblically correct, you need to put a sign on every side of this property. They owned a church, uh, they owned a city block, that church did, huge. He said, every one of those signs, every week you ought to change out the name to a biblical name of the church. Because Church of Christ ain't the only biblical name out there. Well, they didn't do that, but he did present an interesting problem for them to consider. Bob Dylan once said, you will find God in the church of your choice. Now, how many of you ever thought I'd quote Bob Dylan in a sermon? (laughs) But look at what he says. What he says is popular thought, probably because he said it. You will find God in the church of your choice. You know, that sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? Sounds nice, sounds appealing in our culture that caters to our every whim. That's, that's the world we live in. We live in a world that bends to our will. We live in a world that caters to our every whim where truth is subjective and where we can have everything our way. Seems like I've heard that in a commercial before. The customer's always right. And Bob Dylan is applying that to the church. You will find God in the church of your choice. The only problem I have with that is I can't can't find book, chapter, and verse to support that. I can't find a scriptural foundation for that thought or for that statement. Tonight we're going to begin a study of a very sensitive subject. I can promise you there are people that will have issues with what we're going to talk about. And I'll just go ahead and say it. You're probably, some of you are probably going to disagree with some of the things I'm going to say over the course of this study. There's an article in Live Science that states that there are over 200 Christian denominations in the United States alone. And that there are 45,000 plus Christian denominations globally. Now think about that for just a second. That's just... Let's just focus on the U.S. for a moment. 200 Christian denominations. Now, I find it amazing that there can be that much division over one God and one book. But there is. There is. And for what Jesus prayed just before going to the cross, I don't believe that He or the Father in heaven is very pleased with all of this division among those who claim to be his people. Jesus prayed in the garden in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. He says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, talking about us, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Think about it for just a second. You wonder why people doubt the Bible. You wonder why people doubt God, why people have problems with Christians. Look at what Jesus said and how he tied the importance of our oneness as believers to the message. He says that they may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. For what purpose? Look at what he says. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now family, take a good look at what Jesus says there. And ask yourself this question. 
How did we wind up with all this division among those who claim to follow Jesus? Who knows? To try to answer that question would take a lot of time. And to answer that question would probably result in a lot more division because that would lead to a whole lot of finger pointing, and that's never productive. The real question that needs to be answered is this. What does the church of the Bible look like? Because if people can take an honest look and try to find the honest biblical answer to that question at what the scriptures say regarding that question, what does the church of the Bible look like, then perhaps unity may be gained. At the very least, we'll know who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing to accomplish the mission of the church. Family, the simple fact of the matter is that today, most believers have no idea why they attend the church that they do. They have no idea why they attend the church that they do. They have no idea why they do what they do in the church that they attend. Beyond the surface. Beyond the superficial things. When asked that question, why do you attend the church that you attend? Why do you uh, worship with that group of believers? The answers range from, honestly, I don't know, to I like it here to we got a good youth program for my kids, to this is the way we've always done it as a family. They don't dig any deeper than that. For them, that's good enough. And none of those are biblical answers. They're human answers. They're answers that appeal to our human preferences and not to God's word. Those are answers that deal more with what we want than what God wants. And so the question comes, and we have to ask this question. What's more important? What we want or what God wants? Because many times what we want and what God wants doesn't always match up. And what we want and what God wants, when that doesn't match up, a decision has to be made. Family, what, are we, what we're going to discover, I think, over the course of our study, is that the reason why we have over 200 Christian denominations in the United States and 45,000 worldwide is because people have chosen what they want over what God wants. And what he's prescribed in his word. So what is the church of the Bible? That's a question we have to ask. What is the church of the Bible? Maybe the best way to answer that question is to first understand what the church of the Bible isn't. To begin with, the church of the Bible isn't the building. This building holds a lot of meaning for a lot of people. Some of you grew up in this building. Some of you remember when this building was, was built in 1969. This building, this, these bricks and mortar and, and beams and structure holds a lot of sentimental value for you. But this is not the church. The church is not the building. How many times have you heard somebody say, wow, that's a beautiful church? They come just short of being accurate. You see, if they were being accurate, they would have said, wow, what a beautiful church building that is. Family, the church of the Bible is not a material structure. A lot of people think that it is. A lot of people think that there's something special, something mystical about the place. The church is not a physical structure or a material structure. So what does the Bible say about that? What does the Bible say to, to disprove that, that very popular belief and claim? Paul in his writings clearly says that the body of Christ and the church are the same. Look at what he says 
in the following scriptures. He writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him, being Christ, head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, he writes, He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Paul continues in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, by saying, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am supplementing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions in behalf of of his body, which is the church. Family, in these scriptures we see a a common thread. We see a common thread that ties all of this together that proves that the church is not a building. Paul also says that the body of Christ, the church, is specifically the members. Look at what he says in the following passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. He says, For just as the body is one and yet has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. In Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, he says, For just as we have many parts in one body, and all the body's parts do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ as individually parts of one another. Now take a good look at what he says there to the church in Rome. The body, according to the Bible, is clear that the members are the body. And the body is the church. And family, it is clearly evidence that the members, all of us here assembled, are the church. But here's the thing. Don't miss this. There are people who will say, when they look at that scripture, there are people who will say, that the members of the church are all the different denominations in the world. That those 200 denominations and 45,000 denominations in this country and the world, they're all the members of that body. Even though there is clear disagreement amongst all of those groups on basic doctrinal issues. Now think about that. How can that argument hold any water at all? That all of these different groups make up the one body of Christ when there is stark disagreement on even the most basic biblical doctrines. I believe that we'll come to the conclusion during the course of this study that this very popular belief just isn't accurate. Because when we line up the church of the Bible and what the church of the Bible is and what the church of the Bible does next to the over 200 Christian denominations in the United States alone, most will find themselves not in alignment with what the Bible says, including the church of Christ. Now you may be saying to yourself, did did I hear him right? Yeah, you did. Look at the church of Christ today. How has it changed in the last 30 years? See, when we say the church of Christ, guess what we just did? We just denominated ourselves when you say that. And you think about the way it was 30 years ago. You could go pretty much anywhere in the country, walk into a building that has church of Christ over the door, and know exactly what to expect. That is not the case now. In fact, it's not even the norm now. It's more like Forrest Gump's box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get when you walk through the door. And so it's important for us, even 
within the churches of Christ to understand that the church of the Bible may not be what some of us are doing. This is something that every congregation needs to do. To line up what we're doing against what the Bible says the the church of the Bible is and make sure that they mesh. Make sure that they line up. And if they don't, it's not the church of the Bible that has a problem. It's us. That's the responsibility of congregational leadership. Because the biblical pattern of the church must be followed. Again, the members are the body. The body is the church. So it's clearly evident that the members are the church. Why? Because each individual believer at the point of their salvation is added to the church. They're added to the body, which is the church. The body, which is the church, is made up of individual believers. Not multiple churches, as is very popularly believed. There's one church. There's just one. And each individual believer is added to it by God upon their salvation. In Acts chapter 2, we see this. Following the sermon at Pentecost that was delivered by Peter... And those who heard that message, remember what Jesus said, along about verse 35, 36, he says, you are the ones that nailed him to the cross. You are guilty of the blood of Jesus. You are responsible for putting the Son of God to death on a cross. And when the people heard this, we see what happens in verses 37 and 38. And Peter is asked a question. Look at what it says. <clears throat> It says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, family, it's very, very important that we understand what's going on here because this is the point of salvation. The point of salvation then, the point of salvation today. That has not changed, and it will not change. Because when we hear the word, we're pierced to the heart. When we really hear it, and we really understand like they did, what our sins are guilty of, of putting Jesus on the cross, when we understand that and we come to that realization, we're pierced to the heart by the word to the point that we're ready to be baptized so that our sins may be forgiven. And at that point, look at what Peter says. At that point, we receive the indwelling Holy Spirit as a result of it. So what else happened at that point? You know, typically we kind of tend to move on and don't look at what happened like the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey says. What else happened at that point? We don't think about that enough, but family... We need to understand that something else happened. Something very important happens at the point of our salvation. Look at verse 41. It says, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Now it's important that we understand exactly what that says and what that means. Take a good look at that. We've already seen that they heard the word. We've already seen that they were convicted of their own sins through the word. We've already seen that they repented of their sins and that their sins were forgiven at the point of baptism and that they received the indwelling Holy Spirit. We've seen all of that. And we also need to see that they were added that day to their number. To the apostles to the disciples, to the church, to the 120 brothers and sisters that started out that day as those that followed Jesus, as we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. In one day, 
One day, the body of Christ, the church, added 3,000 to their number. Man, I'd love to have a day like that around here. But it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. The church continued to add to their number. According to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, look at what it says. And the Lord was adding. We don't add. The Lord was adding. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Those who were repenting and confessing and having their sins washed away in baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit. They were being added by the Lord day by day those who were being saved. Now look at exactly what that says. And understand exactly what that says and answer this question. Do we join the church? Or does the Lord add us to the church? You see, this is another point of confusion in the Christian world. Do we join the church or are we added to the church by the Lord? Because if you take God's word seriously, if you look at what it says there in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, there can only be one answer to that question. And the answer to that question is this. No one has ever joined the church of the Bible. Family saved people can't be added to a physical structure either. See, the church isn't the building. Saved people can't be added to a physical structure and become part of it and live to tell about it. And people do not join the church, but the Lord adds them as they're being saved. That's what the Bible says. That's what the church of the Bible looks like. And so what people have to do is line up what they're doing and what they're practicing against what we've already shared today. Does it, does it add up? If it does, great. If not, there's a problem. Family, the scriptures prove that the church is not a physical building, but the spiritual body of Christ built of individual believers. And Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, solidifies that point beautifully. I love the way he puts it, because the way he puts it is, is so beautiful. Listen to what he says. He says, In coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also... As living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now take a good look at that. Peter says saved people don't go to church. They are the church. The saved are the body of Christ. The saved are these living stones that that he talks about, that comes together, that have come together this evening as his body, which is the church of the Bible. So what do we do when someone says, hey, I'd, I'd like to join the church? What do we do when someone says that? How do we address that when it happens? Do we whip out Acts chapter 2, verse 47 and start beating them over the head with it? Not if we want the church to grow. Probably not a good idea. Family, like any other biblical issue, when a question is raised by someone who doesn't really know the answer, we have to redirect people to the Scriptures. We have to redirect people to the Word. We have to redirect them to what the Word says about the church of the Bible and stay centered on God's Word. That's why it's important for us to know what God's Word says. That's why it's important for us to share what we're learning with our families, to share with our children, with our grandchildren. I was preaching one Sunday in Surprise, Arizona several years ago. And a young couple with two elementary age children, actually an elementary age daughter and an infant son, they walked the aisle. They had been visiting with us for 
uh, a few weeks, and, and they walked the aisle. They responded uh, to the invitation, you know, that part of the invitation where I say, hey, if you're looking for a church home, I hope you found it. We'd love to have you here, the Church of Christ. And they walked the aisle. And following the message, they came down and said that they would like to join the church. It's not uncommon. It happens a lot. They said, we'd like to join the church. And you know, whether people realize it or not, this is a misconception, whether people realize it or not, placing membership and joining the church is an addition of man to church vernacular. You won't find book, chapter, and verse for that anywhere. If you can find it, I'd like to see it. It's just not there. It's something that over the course of time, we've kind of elevated pretty high, probably higher than we should. But anyway, it's basically the same thing. And so what did I do when, and I'll just say Brad and Angie, that's their first names. What did I do with Brad and Angie and their beautiful little family walk the aisle and said, hey, we want to join the church. Did I tell them, no, you can't join the church because the church isn't something that you join. The church is something that you're added to. Did I do that? While they're on the front row at the end of services in front of the church. No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that because I knew that if I did, they would feel completely and totally rejected and would never return. Did I tell them, no, you, you can't join the church because first you have to be baptized into Christ and then, then added to the church by the Lord, even though that's scripturally correct. Did I tell them that? The answer is no, I didn't, because we really didn't have time to go into all of that on the front row, at the end of services, in front of everyone. And if I had, it would have communicated the same message. It would have communicated a message of rejection. So what did I tell them? What did I tell Brad and Angie and their beautiful children who wanted to join the church? What did I tell them? I said, you know what? That's great news. We're glad that you want to be involved with the church. And I'd really like the opportunity to study with you about being added to the kingdom. And they looked at each other and they smiled. And they said, yeah, we'd really like that. And I, then I said, okay, tell you what. I'm going to share with the congregation your desire to identify with us. And about our study about being added to the kingdom. And they said, okay. So I stood before the congregation and I announced to the church family, Brad and Angie have come wishing to identify with our congregation. And I'm looking forward to studying with them about being added to the kingdom. Four weeks later, they both were baptized into Christ. They weren't added to a building. They didn't join the church. They said, hey... We like it here, and we want to serve with you. We want to learn more about what it means to be added to the kingdom. And we were able to do that without rejecting them, but still accomplishing the mission. The church is not a building, and the church is not something that you join. It's the body of Christ. It's the kingdom of God that we're added to upon our salvation. <clears throat> and so my question tonight for anyone here in the auditorium and anybody watching online, have you been added to the kingdom? That may be the most important question anybody ever asks you. Because if you go back to Acts chapter 2, that is exactly the question, more or less, that the people asked when Peter delivered that message and convicted them of their sins. And they had no other place to turn because they knew that they were dead to rights guilty. Their sins had put Jesus on the cross. And they said, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. 
so that your sins may be forgiven and so that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And later, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, that 3,000 were added to their number. And in verse 47, that the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Have you been added to the kingdom? If not, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you so that you can accomplish the greatest blessing in your life that Jesus went to the cross to pay for you. If he needs to pray with you and to pray for you for for other things that are concerning you, that invitation is open to you as well. Whatever your need tonight, respond to the Lord as he invites you while we stand and sing.